Well, good evening, everyone. We're back again with Radio Free Norfolk. Uh, so we're here with the continuing with the artist in profile. Probably one of my most requested artists that I've ever had, because when we did the first one, everyone said I have to have Nara on the show. So uh, we asked Nara to come in. So here you are. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, so often we start with how people got where they are. So le- I guess let's start with um, how did you come to Canada? Well, initially I came for a holiday. See, I've already started doing a silly voice. <laughs> what is wrong with me? Just be normal. So initially I came to Canada for a holiday and I went to places like Niagara Falls and found that amazing. Actually, I love Niagara Falls. It's one of my favorite places. Um, and I met some cousins that I'd never met in Hamilton before. And, um, my mum was here. She came earlier and then I went home back to London and I thought about it and I thought about it a bit more. And then I had another think about it (laughs) (laughs) and then I thought, well, you know what? I think I should come and try and live here in Canada it's so cool it's so big there was so much space you could do a cartwheel in a parking lot and you'd be okay you wouldn't smack anybody in the face so I had to be legally here and I had to do the nanny program the caregiver live-in program oh yeah it's a two-year program through an agency so I met a family I had an interview and um I kind of liked them. I think they kind of liked me at the time. And I uh, went back home again and I came back and I lived in with them in Hamilton for a couple of years. I did a few different nanny jobs. And then I was here. Yeah. So in England, you went to school and you went, what did you go to university to or to college to? This helped me get my nannying program going. It was the special needs caregiver program and it was with children and that was a course in Canterbury, in Kent, in England. So what attracted you to that? Well, I had really rubbish grades at school. So basically, <laughs> it was the only thing I could get into. No, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> some of that is true because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I always wanted to act. I right. knew that. But feasibly, I probably was too shy at the time and not ready for that kind of a thing. So, And kids and I got on really well. My nickname at school was Peter Pan, and it is still Peter Pan here. Um, So I thought, well, I'm going to have a go. And so I enrolled in the program, which was a really cool program, and I was just goofy throughout the whole thing. But the kids and I got on really, really well. Hmm. And, yeah, that helped me get my nanny position. So then you came to to Canada, and then you you started as a nanny. Yeah. So it was a family, family in Hamilton. Yep. So how long were you there for? Two years, two and a bit years in that program. And then I was in another fa- with another family as well. Um, and I just met so many people in Hamilton. And I started to enjoy the karaoke scene. That was the backup. Oh, good Lord. Something to do, right? It's something to do but at night. But why don't you and my wife get along so swimmingly? Yeah, well, she, she's, got, she's got quite the voice on her, eh? Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. on. Yeah, and the nannies and I would go out and we'd do karaoke together because there was a group of nanny girls and there were a few guys that followed us around. You know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, maybe not, but we went and we went to these karaoke bars and we had we had a really good time. A lot of things in Canada that I didn't know about that so, I learned. So you nanny by day. Nanny by day. Karaoke, karaoke singer by night. By night. Yeah. And so you did this for two years. And then, and then, so after that, you went and you were a, a drama teacher. Yeah, yeah. How do you know that? Oh, I, I know things. You're amazing. I, I, I can't tell my secrets. It's like I gave you something before we started I, this, but well, I didn't. Well, I didn't did, want to say did anything, I? but I don't know. Okay. Weird. Um, <laughs> for all you listeners at home, <laughs> he did. Yeah, I, um, I met this amazing woman who became my boss, who was my boss. And we got on very, very well. And she and I 
had this one thing in common is that we wanted people to think for themselves, kids to think for themselves and not rely too heavily on the kindness of strangers. Mm -hmm. But um, so she, she said, well, why don't you work for me? You, you need to do something for me. I feel like you're, you'd be really great with the kids. You, you know kids and you're, you do weird stuff with your voice and, and you kind of write your own scripts and stuff. So I'm like, I tried it. Seven years later, I was still doing it. And I did it all. I did summer camps and I did, we wrote our own scripts. The kids performed their own plays, taught them how to do accents. It was fun. So where, where did you do this at? So it, like in a school or at a... Yeah, it was a, we rented, they rented a gym in a, a daycare, actually, this massive gym. And it was an after school program. And I taught children from actually five to 14. And I was pretty much going really strong there for a good seven years. And then um, my boss, the lady, my friend who originally hired me, she was going off in another direction. And so I was like, hey, I think I'm going off. It's a seven year thing, right? That itch right. that you get. My cells were changing in my body. I could feel it. And I was like, well, I'm going to go off and do something else as well. And it So was, the, the scripts you were doing, like the students got to write that stuff? Yeah, I made sure because I'm so bent on, on kids finding themselves. And so I wanted them to understand that some, some of these kids were so talented and some were so shy with that talent and I wanted to bring the confidence in so that they could really blossom. So they would write their own scripts. I'd help them a little bit with it, um, with the comedy aspect of it, especially because I, I wanted them to see. Kids are hilarious to me. They're, they're funny from babies to, I just find everybody funny, really. And everyone's quirky and I just find a character in everything. So the kids would write their own scripts and perform them and the parents would come and watch these original works of art and they would laugh their heads off most of the time and they would go oh my gosh I didn't even know that Johnny could do that it's not Johnny because you're I'm looking at you and you're Johnny aren't you <laughs> or whoever but it was just like these amazing little people would turn into different people but they would bring their own selves into the script right and I loved it I loved it so was it the same students every year or new students all the time? A lot came back. I saw a lot of kids grow up in seven years, but there were a lot of new kids that came through as well. Yeah, summer camps, man. Ooh, a bit painful. You know how it is. I have done summer camps before, yes. Aren't they lovely? Uh, it, it, it's like a rite of passage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I mean, I remember this. I lovingly remember the summer camps being... The noise level was outrageous and that you're standing there with 50 children and there's not too much you can do sometimes. So the camps were what, a week at a time? Yeah, a week at a time, all age groups, changing the week, um, different themes as well. So did it, you just do it for one week or did you do it for like a whole summer? I did it the whole summer. <clears throat> so and, then, just... and then towards the end, I did it for one week because I just felt I was going to be leaving that shortly. So I slowly back to away. Weaned away yeah. yeah I still loved it though I think about it fondly now there was one summer camp where we wrote a country western script and there was this one boy who was not even from this country he was Polish and he had this Texan kind of accent he's going on like that you know what I'm talking about and he would whistle he could whistle while he was talking and he cracked everybody up he was the best kid and he was the shyest kid in the beginning. And he just showed off for his mum and dad that last day. Quite brilliant. I know when Meredith and I were in theater companies and we got to do the school shows. One of the things we, a lot of times when I was overseas, we did an English language uh, program. So Sweden, Denmark, Germany, and whatnot. When you got the kids up there and they got over the shyness, it's all, some of the most funniest things that ever I saw on stage were done by those kids. Oh, isn't it true? It's true. Kids are hilarious. And then when they get over those inhibitions, there's nothing that'll hold them back. I know. And then you're like, hey, calm down a bit, will you? <laughs> Show off. Especially a Polish kid with a, a Texas accent. That'd be, that'd yeah. be really cool. I can still see him too. He had flashy blue eyes and 
very, very blonde hair. And he was so cool with that cowboy hat on. There were, he was in a band in the play. And there was one point in the play where he had to say, let's start a band like that. And he would shout it and throw his cowboy hat in the, in the air. Nobody told him to do that. He did it. So when you were younger, where, like, how did you discover that you wanted to do that? You said you always wanted to act, but like, where did mm. you find it? Well, that's a really good question. Where did I find it? I found it deep within myself. It was literally my soul's calling as at a young age. My dad gave, oh, funny, my dad, when I was three, he gave me a microphone and he said, do whatever you want with this and just press the record button and you'll be fine. And I never really put it down. So I would always listen to my mum and dad's friends who would come over and they had different accents. And I would hide behind the couch with my microphone and I would record everything that they said. And then I'd play it back in my room and I would study the accents. And, you know, with comedians like Carol Burnett and Lucille Ball and all the old stuff, because I love the old stuff. I just, I just always had this thing about acting I'd, I'd always love theater it's just you know when you're a natural with something you just never mm -hmm. let it lie mm -hmm. really you do it too and you can't you can't stop thinking about it but I was very shy I was painfully shy at school and school was not a great time for me so it it always nagged me and even my boss one day was she was like what are you gonna do what you're great it's good with the kids, but what are you going to do for you? And I was like, well, I don't know. I really, and why don't you just do that? Try that. Try at least to do that. So I sort of, when I came to Dover, when I came to Port Dover, it, it became bigger, that sound in the small voice. So then Mary Poppins, you know. So when you were, when you were in England, where was the first time that you, you went on? Like how, where was the first time you performed somewhere? In front of my family at Christmas time with my cousin John from London and my cousin Mark from London, who always played the policeman in our plays. We would write plays together. So literally when I was probably 10, my cousin John and I would write songs together. We actually wrote an album and we sent it to a record company and they were so sweet. <laughs> they sent a letter back and said, that's really lovely, isn't that? A lo that's lovely that you sent us that. But, you know, it's it's lovely, but it's just lovely. <laughs> but it's not for us. So, yeah, I've always, it's always been a family affair to perform a show at Christmas and and do the voices too, yeah. It's always been that way. Publicly at school, yeah. I was in a drama in a production. I was, um, I played a sexy pirate <laughs> <laughs> in what in a school show it was the vain pirate but my teacher was like so you're going to be the sexy pirate who's looking in the mirror all the time <laughs> and I did that and I, I had such a good time I had oh my god it was amazing people were like whoa who are you right now I'm a sexy pirate <laughs> silly but fun so from the drama teacher then you go to selling glasses Yes. Yes. I um, see when I'm in transition in between big change. I, it's quite the big, it's quite the big change. It's huge. It's, you know what happened? I went in to get my eyes tested one day and they said, do you want to work here? And I'm like, oh, I just said I could see that that letter was B. And they were like, well, you should probably um, see what else you can see here. So I did that for a while and I actually was terrible at it. What? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just because I'm no good with sales, you see. I'm I'm the worst salesperson because I give I want to give people everything for free straight away. I don't go through the spiel. All right. All right. I, I run straight to the seventy five percent off. So did did you get to do any funny voices when you were doing sales? I did it all the time. All the time. And I did it with my workers. Like I had a great time there and I tinted glasses as well, sunglasses, which I love to do. Apparently I know how to tint a sunglass, like <laughs> it's nobody's business. Um, yeah. And I did, I did stand up comedy 
while I was in there. Um, but as far as it went with sales, I was just not my bag, baby. You know what I mean? So how long did you sell glasses for? Um, I was there for three years. No, four years. Yeah. Yeah, four years. There the was the cool part of it was I gave away so much stuff <laughs> to people and they kept coming back. But then after a while, I think we ran out of things to give them. <laughs> and then they didn't come back anymore. <laughs> so after you are done selling glasses, then where did you go? So I opened up my own cleaning company. So how did you go from glasses to, like, what was the natural extension to cleaning? So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of an oddity because I like to try a bit of everything. And I, I just want to have a go everything I feel like life has got to be spicy and even if you're cleaning you can have a good time so I was in a play actually while I was cleaning so I was learning and I was cleaning at night office buildings and I was learning my lines and singing and there's no one in the whole building god I hope there wasn't anybody there and I was singing at the top of my lungs while I was mopping the floor and um, I was in this play in Hamilton and I learned my lines and sang and learnt my chord charts and everything while I was doing that job. And I always found that while I was cleaning, I was thinking up these amazing ideas. To me, they're amazing, right? They're always, oh, I'm so cool. But I was thinking up script ideas and voice ideas and characters. And I would get home and I'd write them down. And I was actually in a comedy duo as well with another girl. And we did quite a bit of touring and we, I did a lot of this stuff while I was cleaning because I, I find if you whistle while you work, no, I'm not going there, sorry. But while I'm doing something physically, I'm having these ideas. So cleaning was like this cool double life that I was leaving, living and it worked really well for doing comedy. Such a strange thing, isn't it? I just, things popped into my head all the time. I clean the loo, you know. You're cleaning a porcelain bowl and you've got your face rather close to the water. And, oh, I think I should write about Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> Strange, though. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how long did you th do the cleaning for? I don't even know, really. I think it must have been the good part of three years. So you're coming up with all this different stuff. Yeah. Did you do anything with it at that time? or? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, so you said you were doing, doing like, it, some touring. So what, what did that entail? That entailed making up scenes with this other girl that I was working with. Um, we would do well, we would do funny dances to Celine Dion songs and choreography, which is awful. It's all terrible choreography, which is part of my spiel, is just being clumsy, as you know, um, so that nothing really mattered so that every piece of art that came out of that year, the years that we toured together were, it didn't matter if you made a mistake and you weren't perfect. And that's how I like to be is because life is so impermanent all the time that nothing really matters. And so our comedy was based on using popularity with music maybe, or we make up our own characters. But if we made a mistake, a lot of it was improv. Like a lot of what I do is improv anyway. Because um, I don't like to stick to the script unless I'm in a show and then I, I try and keep it within the boundaries. But for the most part, the, the comedy that we did was aligned with me falling flat on my face and her trying to pick me up and taking her sweet ass time about it. And that was great. So it, where, where would you do these shows? Well, it was really cool because there was a place in Hamilton, still is, called The Pearl Company. And we started, we did our very first show there. And it was great. It was packed. It was like we did all our own marketing and dee dee dee. And then we got involved um, with a, a group that had like different pe acts in one group. And we did all the legions around Ontario. And the legions loved it. Like we'd open and we'd host for this show and all the legions were sold out and we did this. Oh, it was so amazing. Actually, now I think about it. It was a really cool upbringing in theater, getting out of shy Nara to coming out Nara, mm -hmm. literally in blossoming and 
understanding that creativity is so important to living, right? Like, I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I couldn't create, like, anyone. doesn't matter who you are. So then after that, then you come to Dover. Yeah. So. <laughs> so. So now you land here. So the, so once you came to Dover, you started doing um, voiceover work and singing stuff. Yeah. Comedy. Yeah. I um, I came to Dover. It's nearly three years now. The, the big change again. You know, the transition. So my cells were saying, hey, it's time to move again. So that's what we have to do. So where are we going to go? And I was like, well, don't talk to me like that, you know, first of all. And then I was like, well, I had a friend in Dover, so I'm going to go to Dover. So I come to Dover and I see this magnificent theatre. It's so cool and such a nice town. And I don't know anybody really except the one lady and her mother, who I help now. She is in a retirement home. And I see an audition for Mary Poppins. And I think I might go to that. And I'm so nervous because I don't know anybody. So I go and I, I get a role in Mary Poppins. And it's the comic relief mm -hmm. type role. And I tell you something about that play. I had the best time. That play... For morale and support, unbelievable. And the Lighthouse Theatre, isn't it amazing? When I finally got to go on stage with uh, Lemmy a tenor, oh, it's a yeah. it's a spoiling experience, isn't it? In other, not to speak ill of other theatres, but other theatres are small community theatres, and everyone's volunteer. And then, you know, like the sounds volunteer, the production, the uh, promotions volunteer, like everything is. And so you're. <laughs> It's, it's a good environment for learning, but if you've done theater for a while and then you have, you've kind of missed it and you get on the lighthouse theater stage, it's perfect, you know, professional sound, professional lighting, professional production, professional uh, promotion. And then you just get, to, you get to go up there and you just get to act. It's wonderful. I couldn't believe how wonderful that, oh, that stage is amazing. And the people... But, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could go on, but well, the, do. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's what we're doing. <laughs> this aren't is all we? about you, eh? Oh, stop. It's just too much. Um, you know what it was that struck me? I think because first of all, I went to the audition, and um, can we name names? Yeah. Okay. So JP was there, he, and was playing Bert, and and I didn't really realize what was going on at the time, but um, and Derek was there the artistic director of the Lighthouse Theatre. And um, he ran me through it. Uh, because I initially decided that I would go out for Mary Poppins, which is really funny. So I did it. And Derek saw comedy in me. And I didn't know what I was doing. Anyway, so I read a few different ways with JP. And uh, then I got the email that he was going to offer me Roberts and I the maid who's kind of blind and she's a bit quirky and I was so delighted to get that email because I that moment I realized that I don't even want to be Mary Poppins your wife is Mary Poppins right two Mary Poppins but I don't want to I want to stick with what I feel comfortable doing and it's always going to be comedy it's always going to be the the slapstick kind of humor but then I've done some serious stuff too and I've really thoroughly enjoyed that, but yeah. No, but in that role, I, I thought you did an exceptional job in that role. Thank you. And uh, like, I've, we've seen a lot of theater over the years. And the one thing I think that you really, you get is a lot of the stuff is, it's kind of like a recipe, right? Yeah. So the main character is like the flower. And then you have some characters that are egg that kind of help to bind that together. And then, then you have the frosting characters. And then you have kind of like this decoration character, right? Really, for me, your character in that is really like a decoration sort of a thing. And what I mean by that is you have all this good stuff happening, but then the real flavor, the joy, and the delight of several moments in that play come out when your character does the most crazy things and you embodied that so well like in terms of character acting you're very very talented and good at that and i think it's a good read and then the other part where of course derek is probably pulling out some stuff but mm -hmm. you handled that so well that 
moments that were good were then accentuated into spectacular by just small little pieces, little moments where you look funny looks or the way you handled some business. It was it was amazing. Wow, thanks, mate. There Thank you, you. There you go. Let's hear it for John. <laughs> that was that's really sweet. That makes me feel really good. Because that's what I love to do, yeah. Oh, you think you do it very well. Thank you. So after Mary Poppins, you let, or do you want to talk about Mary Poppins some more? No. <laughs> so after Mary Poppins, you get done with a good show like that, and then you kind of have nothing else. What what happens then? Um. Well, I'm still I'm singing in retirement homes. I'm I'm engaged in employment in retirement homes. Two different ones: one in Simcoe, one in Waterford. And they've got me singing once a week, both places. And I do a name that tune format with the residents. When Meredith and I toured professionally, yeah. we would come into a town and we might not have a show. And there were other shows, other areas that we would go to, I would go to routinely. And we always had nursing home shows. They were kind of like the, the staple filler, right? I didn't know that. I loved those shows. Wow. I mean, what, what do you like about them? You know what I love? Because I love the old music so much um i really identify with the bing crosby and the andrew sisters stuff like my mom and dad had records of, of every genre of every era and i would listen to them constantly and i just i really identify that when i see and i'm singing and i see somebody closing their eyes and putting their head back slightly and savoring the moment like that that makes me feel so good and then if somebody's crying, you know, it's just, what else can you say about that? That's like bringing back the memory of a lifetime mm -hmm. for somebody. It's brilliant. And I love working with people of a senior age. So when you do the show, they do the show, do you stay and talk with them afterwards or how does Yeah, it... I, I do funny stuff with people. Like now I'm pretty... I know quite a few people. So there's a lot of sarcasm that gets split back and forth from the audience. Like it's kind of like you're doing stand up and singing and doing a game show at the same time. Right. And that seems to be working well. And my mission is to bring laughter into the, into the darkness at any point and for anyone at any time. So I love that aspect of it, the interaction. That was always my favorite part is that we, we had this show once where a lady was there and she didn't speak for seven or eight years. And then we did a show and then she started calling out a name, right? Wow. All the staff started crying and we didn't get it. And then they said, you know, John, she hasn't spoke for seven years. And then we sat with her for a couple hours and just kind of talked. And it was something in the play that sparked something off. Yeah. And then it just opened up something. Right. So those moments for me were always the best moments that it's a small little show that maybe no one's ever going to remember, except for it. Like you said, it brings joy and laughter into a place that sometimes it's been missing for quite some time. Yes, yeah, so. often quite dark for people. A lot of people are in pain. They don't talk about it, but you can see it on their face. And that's so cool that that lady. I love that. It was, it was, and we, st we didn't know what it was. It, she just started, uh, it was like an old family, like a, we couldn't tell it was like a relative or something. And she just kept talking. And then we contacted the nursing home a year later and they said, yeah, after that she's talks and she does all sorts of other stuff. It would just unlocked something for her. Oh, that's and, incredible. And it's those performances that for me were what kind of drove me when I was on the ro road professionally. You had the big venues. That was nice, but it was, you know, the day to day bread and butter going into this place it was i can't remember what we made like 300 dollars a show it was nothing right yeah but at the same point it was everything to these people and for me that's where i gave my most is in yes. those type of things so. it's so satisfying isn't well i'm it? glad that you're doing those because i think locally that is something that's desperately needed yeah i'd love to do more too so if anybody knows anyone <laughs> seriously i i feel like it's such an important thing to do that I would love to do more. So anywhere beyond Burlington, I would go as far as it as it needed to be to do it. Yeah. So here you do it just in Dover or I do it in Waterford and Simcoe here. And 
I've done the odd show, like just one off show for senior support. Yep. I'm signed up with senior support. So when they need, they have a diners club type legion thing going on. I do the game show there as well. And, um, some other senior services that call up sometimes adult day programs too. Yep. I've done a few there. Yep. You should partner up with Meredith. She would, uh, at Christmas time, they invite her in for Christmas carols. Oh. And then she brings the kids in. No. So. no I know. I'm telling you. Okay. So, so you got that going. Yeah. Uh, you were doing some comedy stuff mm-hmm. at different places. What, what kind of places were you doing that at? Um, I just recently did, uh, I opened for the Fishnets. Do you know oh, the fishnets of know. Port Dover? I do, I do. Yes. Um, they asked me to open their singing show, Songs We Like to Sing, they called it. And I did my, I actually did, I I thought a lot about it. I was like, what can I do? i got to get the crowd going, got to warm them up. So, yeah, I know what I'll do. I'll do a game show. So <laughs> I took the three most popular game shows, The Price is Right, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, and I made up some funny questions and I had five people sit on stage and JP, who we know and love, he was my... He's all right. He's all right. He's all right. He was a woman that night. He was my beautiful assistant because it was all about women and comedy. So I was the host. We switched, the tables turned. I became the host and he was my assistant. And it was so much fun to do that show. And people, I I'm, I'm just want people to shout you know, a money number at me, like at the people, you know, in the game shows on TV, they're like $24, 59 cents. And I'm like, come on guys. There was very quiet. And then after a while, the din started and people started shouting at the contestants and it was brilliant. Some people are a little too loud. I just want to put that out there, but who cares? Yeah, it was fun. It was great. And we did two shows that day and then, Oh, in between that, I went to an audition for Tailgate Talent. I, well, yes. And how did you do there? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, another lad and I, I, it was weird because I went in and I, I read my script that I'd written a, an old radio show from the 1940s. I did like five different voices that I love to do. Yep. Like, you know, the policeman and the maid and the lady of the house and this scientist and I read the I read it out loud on the mic rather like this and then I dropped the page on the ground and then they filmed a few things and then they announced two winners at the end of it and one was myself I couldn't believe it I was not surprised so oh, it was it was I was I'm still stunned yeah so will you win that and what did, what did you win? Well, you win the chance to go to the finals September 14th and back in Simcoe here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they go to Sudbury. They go to, they're in Aylmer right now and they'll go farthest to Sudbury and then come back. And then, or you can win and uh, win $1,000. Nice. Yeah. And they asked me, what will you do with that money? And I thought, you know what I would like to do for real? I would really like to write a show with a group of thespians and tour with it. So if I win, I'm going to put that money towards that. So you're going to write it, like you're going to write a script. We're all going to write a musical together and we're going to go on the road with it and we're going to sell it to retirement homes. Who knows? That's true. So in between that, you went to Lighthouse again. I did. And you went in for Wizard of Oz. I did. So you went from just like a comic relief part to, what'd you play? The Scarecrow. It's a pretty big part. It was huge. How'd you feel about that? Fantabulously supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Since as being a child watching The Wizard of Oz on TV every Christmas, every Christmas, it was The Sound of Music. And then it was The Wizard of Oz. And then it was Mary Poppins. And I'd stay up and watch the three in, in a row yep. every Christmas. And I always wanted to be the scarecrow. Always. Always. Always, always, always. Always. Always, always. And, you know, the more I thought about it, it's because this guy, this scarecrow, right, he's, he's already got his brain, really, 
this dramatic overview of a different person. They've all got their hearts and everything, but I, the one person I could identify with was the brainless one, obviously, for obvious reasons. Don't say anything. And, <laughs> and then I, when I went for the audition, I, they said, who do you want to go out for? And I was like, the scarecrow. And that's the role I got. And it was the best role I've ever had, ever. It was so satisfying to do the scarecrow. And I got I had bruises all over my legs, you know, from falling on the stage yep. continuously, or throwing myself down on the stage, as somebody put it. And it was just really cool because I got to play alongside a really good friend, Jason Mayo. That's another guy that's okay too. He's know. all right. No, I'm telling you. Might be on the show soon to Oh my a bit god. Of, bit of a spoiler. Oh somewhere. my god. What do you like about Jason Mayo, John? Oh, I love everything. One of the thing okay, yeah. I was gonna save this for that, but I since we're gonna talk about him a little bit here. One of my favorite things is that whenever he and I go to a show together, we have a very guilty pleasure of getting together and breaking down the play and analyzing the play. Talking about the writing, <laughs> talking about the acting, <laughs> talking about the singing. Oh, uh, so when I go to a show, and, and shows are great, like, you know, lots of shows are great, but then you turn around and there's Jason, then I know <laughs> the show just went, how, no wonder the quality of show, attending that show just went up several notches because there's going to be one time that he and I are standing by the bar together say, well, John, tell me what you think. And so. That is so Jason. Yeah, I love it. It's one of my main one of my very favorite things you like to critique with jason i do and, and just because he's shockingly candid he is yeah, yeah. and he, he's very good on stage too i mean when especially when all you guys together as an ensemble were there uh richard dub again oh. amazing but the way that i think that there was a lot of connection on, on in that performance that and, and you guys also had the ability to play off each other really well. Yeah. And sometimes that chemistry doesn't always work. But I thought it, it worked really well, in the, especially in that play. That's true. Yeah, I was amazed. at It just flowed really naturally. And Libby, who played Dorothy, Libby Adams, everybody, she, I, nobody, I knew nothing about her. All I knew was that she was the cousin of Mrs. Brill from Mary Poppins. And I just found out that she was this person that would just come on stage and she was already in character. She was in character the whole time, actually. And she was really funny to work with because she had these great one-liners and she kind of whisper stuff to you while you were standing there. Oh, whoops, you're not supposed to do that. But um, yeah, we all had really good chemistry with each other, even when things went wrong. And we, yeah, it was just, it worked really well, didn't it? I thought that play was very good, yeah. What did you... I feel like I'm interviewing you uh, now. It's, it just happens. That's you know? really Especially funny. with you, I lose control of these things, you know. Yeah, you know what I'm talking... Okay, so uh, let me ask you a question, John. Um, so you're a NDP, right? Oh, that's a complicated okay, question. Okay, I'm not going to ask... I'm not going to do that one. Um, did you... How did you feel about the special effects in The Wizard of Oz? I thought they were, they were very very good especially like when they did the the mirror thing that's the one that i loved yes because i wasn't expecting it and then it then it happened and i, I was know, like right? oh. so was that pre-recorded or did they do it live in the back no it was live and i never we never actually got to see what that looked like i only saw it once it was filmed from the booth right but we were on an angle so only the audience could see that whole thing oh so you couldn't see it when it was going on i never saw it we had to pretend you know like a green screen <laughs> But it, what it was was a camera backstage, and they would just come and talk and stand into in front of it. it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I thought it worked really well. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Is that you done with the interviewing me now? I can go back. Oh to... yeah, another question. No, <laughs> you go. Sorry. Uh, so you've done Wizard of Oz. Yeah. So then, what what happens next? Well, or what happening now? I'm currently in rehearsals with a band. <laughs> Oh my god! Well, so now you're in a band. I'm in a band now, <laughs> called the Shrubberies. And so, uh, where did the Shrubberies come from? Please tell me, Monty Python. Monty Python. Where did it really come from? Really? Ah, oh, see, that's a good name. Yeah, a shrubbery. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Yeah. So, because of the light, this is all because of the Lighthouse Theatre, the people that you meet. So JP is in the band. 
Um, Alex is in the band. Mrs. Brill from Mary Poppins. Gillian Adams, cousin of Libby Adams. She is in the band. Um, and oh, who else is in the band? Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I'm playing drums in the band. And uh, Jess Bonna, Bonna, uh, hey, Bomberito. Bomberito. Burrito. I'm just going to call her Burrito. Works for me. I cannot get her last name out. To I, save my life. No one will know. I, you say it again. No, no one will know. No one will know. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> she's in the band and her husband's in the band, Adam. And we are doing some very popular songs at the end of the month. It's really cool, actually. I just feel like we're really good together. And we're doing this at the New Limburg Brewery in Nixon. So how'd that come about? Just someone said, we got to do this show? JP, of course. He approached myself and mrs brill i can't stop calling her mrs brill can i please um jillian who played mrs brill in mary poppins she um she and i was was singing in mary poppins and jp said well hey we do we're in this band and we kind of want to add in some different kind of voices and stuff do you want to do you want to practice with us sometime i'm like yeah sure so then we were practicing at his place and then i thought well i play drums so I'll ask him. This is me talking to myself, my other self. So I asked him and he goes, yeah, sure, bring your cajon, which is a drum that you sit on and it has a bass and it's great. And it just, we came together and we started doing these very popular, almost karaoke songs that everybody knows and loves. And now we're ha we have a gig. And we had our photos taken last night together as a group. So it's legit? It's legit because we're on, we're on paper. We're oh. on paper now. Yeah. And we might do it again too. I'm so excited. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Can you tell? I can. Good. So, so you got that going. And then also you, um, I saw on Facebook you had like some site that you've done um, for voiceover work. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I signed up with a, an online voiceover agency. And what what it does is it it registers your algorithms. It sounds like you're in hospital, doesn't it? So you, you put down what you can do, the sex of what you know, male, female, the character, or list everything that you can do, and then the computer matches you up with these jobs that come in, and you audition online. So I'd be in a soundproof booth, which is the toilet area where <laughs> I live. And I record the audition. Sometimes they send you a script of what they want you to do, a partial script. Yeah. Or you just send in your own recorded voiceover. So I just started doing that recently, actually. And I got two jobs out of maybe 25 that I auditioned for. And the first job I got was, I was so excited to get this job. Man, oh man. I was excited for at least a good 12 hours that day. And... It was for a Ukrainian lady, an elderly Ukrainian woman, and it's for a documentary. And I stayed up all night until I was absolutely knackered. And my voice was all like this, you're not talking like this, you're not pretty. Oh, yo, 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 yo. And I did the, vo the audition and then emailed two weeks later, forgot about it, got the email. And they said, we'd like you to be our voiceover talent. And I was like, what, really? You're going to pay me? It's great. So I got that. And then I got a French lady as well, the same company, actually. So I'm on their roster now. I'm so proud of that. I'm on their roster. So if they get um, a job coming through from a client, they'll come to me first and ask me if I can do it. And Bob's your uncle, Charlie's your aunt. That is really cool. I'm really happy about that. Yeah, I love doing voiceovers. Voiceovers are cool people. <laughs> but you're on the roster. That um, For that company, yeah, which is cool. There are so many jobs. What you can do is you sign up and they'll, they give you the option of declining the audition. Would you ever decline a job? I've had to. Really? Because you, I, what I do is I get a ping don't take that the wrong way, but I get a ping on my phone when a job comes in and you might have half an hour to do it and send it in. The client wants stuff done and I might be driving somewhere and I just can't, but I have pulled over in the van. <laughs> I have pulled over in my 
mobile booth and done an audition. I haven't got the job, but I've done an audition. So if I can do it, I will. Um, And it's very exciting to live like that. It's Mm -hmm. also, I've been asleep sometimes and I just haven't heard it or I've turned it off. But yeah, it's pretty cool. I, and for Meredith and I, once we left professional theater and we, I got a job and we started having kids, mm. we, we talked about this kind of, and in, in when I interviewed her is that it, there reaches a point where that lifestyle escapes you. So I'm, I'm impressed you can still do that, but I try. I, I couldn't uh, chase that life anymore because, you know, it just. Well, you, you got a wife, man. You got kids, you got a dog. Yeah, and I tell you that dog. Yeah, that, that dog, dog. Unbelievable. What a beautiful dog. It is a it is a nice hunting dog. But mm-hmm. but I mean I'm I think it's amazing that you can you can still audition and do those things. So I so you got the voiceover stuff going. It, it, we, do you have uh, there was um you were doing some comedy shows at a local venues in like at a coffee shop or something. Oh yeah, that <laughs> every Tuesday morning from ten to eleven thirty. Yeah, I do. Uh, I sing and do my game show venue. What happened was we, I had a regular group of of seniors that would meet in Port Dover down by the pier in a coffee shop and the coffee shop closed. And I I, I wanted to continue that because it was actually, it was pretty fun and a lot of people were coming. And I was like, well, I work at a retirement home in Waterford. I should approached the ritzy cakes eatery across the road because I was getting to know the girls there and we were having a bit of a laugh you know how it is so I approached them and asked them if once a week for an hour and a half only if I could use a room in there and bring bring my friends over and they were like yeah sure and like no questions asked. it's really weird you know it's like who is this person yeah come on over yeah you do it um so it's been nearly seven months that we've been there and people are coming in and sitting down and we're playing the name, the tune there. And it's really cool. And they're letting me sing as loud as I want. And I leave, we leave before the lunch crowd comes in at 1130, but it's going really well. Yeah. So you are a character actor and it would, yeah. I would be completely remiss if it did not give you the opportunity to demonstrate some of your abilities. Okay. So there's a, because I love the 1940s, I made up a character named Gladys and she is uh, entirely dramatic and she wears a white turban with a a centerpiece of a diamond. She's sort of Gloria Swanson, Joan Crawford type character and she is, uh, she hates her husband but she loves him at the same time. So I'll do a little bit of Gladys. So, Roger, I just want you to know that any time you want to come over here, don't ring the doorbell because it scares the dog. Oh, ding dong. You call me a ding dong, Roger. How dare you? I love you. I hate you. Oh, the phone's ringing. I can't stand it any longer. I've got to pick it up. Hello? Roger, you were just at the door. How could you be on the phone? So that's Gladys. And then um, I have a mad scientist character called Hans von Leitbulbsgorf. So, my dear, I was just noticing that you were here the other day and we were doing scientific experiments on you. Now, I want you to know that I have been watching you for seriously one whole year right now, and I have noticed that the weather is very correlated with your anger. Why is this, you ask? I don't even care what you're talking about, Hans. How dare you watch me for a whole year without me even knowing it? Okay, so those, that's, uh, (laughs) I feel like I'm going to go crazy in a minute. Do you want me to do any more? Keep going. So there's a little leprechaun voice that I do every now and then. And, uh, oh, it's very nice to see you, to see you nice. So that's my leprechaun. Um, who else? So like when I first came to Canada, I was like going through a Tim Hortons drive through right? And they couldn't understand a word I was saying because I was talking like, hello, could I please have a coffee with one cream and one teaspoon full of sugar? And they were like, what? And I was, could I ask, could I have a 
one coffee, a small coffee, with um, one teaspoon of sugar and a little bit of cream, please. I can't understand you. Oh, I'll come in. So I went in. This is true. I went into Tim Hortons in Hamilton uh, and I said it. And she still went, what? And looked at me like I was foreign, which I am. And so I just went, okay, so I'd like to have a coffee, like one coffee, a small one with one sugar and cream. And she was like, oh, okay. And I just thought, wow. Because my dad is American, so I learned the lingo, quite a bit of it. Um, what else can I do? Now I'm all embarrassed. Oh, run with it. Oh, okay. Um, so I have an old man voice, I do. His name is Nathan Bunyan. And he talks like that. And he's like, could I get a coffee with one cream and one sugar, please? I don't mind if you look me in the face while you give it to me. Just don't throw it, all right? I can't stand it over here. You young snapperheads are always all over my lawn. That's Nathan. That's it for now. <laughs> That's a pretty good breath. Thanks. I'm lucky if I can do, you know, Texan, but. Do Texan. It's not very good. Try. Here, I'll talk to you like that. Well, How see, you doing? I, like, I can't go up against. You know, you, you know, I want to go against the, you know, the accent queen. Meredith, pretty good. She's the accent queen. Well, we were we were talking. Didn't you listen to the last podcast, man? No, man. We I'm sorry, about, man. We talked about you. You did. We said. I, I said. You know. You guys are pretty good. Well, not Nara good, but like you know, good, good. Whoa. Yeah. So like, you're the bar. Wow. Yeah. That's. I feel really honored to be here right now. Thank you very much, John. Well, you know, we try. All right. So. I asked Meredith this question. I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. So oh, you oh. said that uh, kind of Mary Poppins was on that list of the things you wanted to perform. And Scarecrow was. Mm -hmm. If you had a list of things you still want to do, what roles that you really want to do, what roles would those be? Wow. Never even thought about that. Well, but see, that's the way we roll here. Don't even have a list, man. No list. You're not on the list. Huh? You can't come in. <laughs> I... Let me just give me a sec. Let me think about that because I feel like, um, you know, what I would really like to do is recreate s famous comedy scenes. Possibly, I really like doing original stuff, but I'd like to recreate a Carol Burnett scene. I was gonna say, if you couldn't have come up with something, I was gonna say my personal dream would be not to to recreate a venue where you could do Carol Burnett like shows. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cause that, uh, that to me, she was absolutely brilliant. She was brilliant. She was, you see the, the gift of improv was in that show. Was it not the gift of bloopers and letting it roll was in that show. And that's how I feel it should be with comedy. It should flow that way. So we don't delete or edit out the bloopers or do it again. No, we don't do that. We are doing it. That's how we do it. And I feel like Carol Burnett, that whole show, well, they all loved each other. Didn't they just all mm -hmm. love each other too much at times? And when she played Miss Hannigan, hey, maybe Miss Hannigan in Annie, that would be a fun role to That do. would be a brilliant role. That would be I, a I great think the part. Carol Burnett format would really work for you. Like you have the writing piece, you have the comedy piece. Yeah. Get a bunch of crazy people from around here to do it. There are so many crazy people around here. If you do it, I'll do it. Okay, I was I'm gonna, I was gonna ask you. I'm telling you, I'm that's in. weird how you just answered me. I just knew telepathy, man. So any other, any other ones you're secretly holding on to? Um, this is gonna sound a bit weird, probably, but there is one song that I always sing with people, the residents, that. Because I, fi I find one of the, our brilliant comedians from the 50s would have been Doris Day. I think she was brilliant. She was very underrated as a comedy actress, more of as a singer, yep. right? And a housewife, yellow hair. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't know why I said that. But I feel like Secret Love, the, the song Secret Love, Calamity Jane, I love that movie so much. And my dad forced me to watch that at gunpoint, probably, without me knowing. 
he made me watch that movie and he said, that's such, this is a good movie. You're going to love this. And I'm like, it's so old. I'm not going to like it, you know. But no, that movie is a treasure. I would love to play Calamity Jane. There you go. I do believe that's on my wife's list as well. Is it really? Oh, I think so. I mean, it's a really, it's, it's, it's not done much anymore, which is unfortunate, but no doris day recently died so maybe someone will remount it i know so i know thanks doris so we're out of time oh uh it was wonderful to have you um in in the studio and i hope that you'll come back again thank you for having me and i look forward to your new studio well i i know my wife has agreed that i can take over the shed (laughs) so um when, when that when that studio gets done we'll have to have you bring you back That'd be great. Thanks for and having I me. And I look forward to when you're actually when you're in the next role. So whatever that is, I, I know we gotta hurry up and find one. All right. All right. Thanks, John. No problem. <laughs>